there are many different kinds of people in the world. You know, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little intimidated. And you can never assume that everyone will react to your strategies in the same way. Deceive or outmaneuver some people and they will spend the rest of their life seeking revenge. Choose your victims and opponents carefully. You understand, these people that I might know, they don't know you. Then never offend or deceive the wrong person. Hey Sopranos fans, welcome to another episode here on Bully Whispers, and we are here today to evaluate Law 19 of Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power, know who you are dealing with, do not offend the wrong person, in the TV show The Sopranos. According to Greene, the ability to measure people and to know who you are dealing with is the most important skill in gathering and conserving power, which is why it makes sense that he started the chapter by identifying the five most dangerous and difficult types of people, and why we will do the same. So in this episode, we will evaluate Law 19 and The Sopranos by first identifying the five most dangerous groups, as well as some of the characters that would fall into each, which is where we run into two different pairs of characters that may have more in common than it appears at first glance. Then, we will move on to why Green says that Law 19 is the most important aspect of acquiring and maintaining power, as shown through Junior Soprano, Jackie Aprile Sr., Tony, and Phil Leotardo, before ending with the group that Tony consistently has the most problems with, where we run into, among other people, Irina, and the surprisingly underexamined and long overdue comparison between her and Genghis Khan. Now before getting started, it's important to note that, being a well-written show, none of the Sopranos characters fall simply into one of the categories. They all have different aspects of another group in them. That being said, most of them do fall largely into one category, and the first of these categories listed is the arrogant and proud man. Though they may initially disguise it, this man's touchy pride makes him dangerous. Any perceived slight will lead to vengeance and possibly overwhelming violence. Arguably, the most over-the-top example of this type is Richie Aprile. You Parmesan sandwich. Fuck you. From whom quick responses of overwhelming violence is a bit of a calling card. Now, it could be argued that since Richie felt all of this goes back to before he went to jail, that he falls into a different category which will be named later. However, his consistent impatience and impulsiveness prevent him from being in that group. Much like our next example of the arrogant and proud man, Tony Soprano. Of course, to be fair, Tony isn't nearly as bad as Richie, since he is capable of holding back somewhat, but nevertheless, Tony falls pretty squarely into the arrogant and proud category. The next category listed is the hopelessly insecure man, whom Green describes as being related to the arrogant and proud man, which is funny because the most notable of this type is Junior Soprano, who is related to the most notable arrogant and proud man on the show, Tony Soprano. The hopelessly insecure man is also often less violent and less bombastic, making them harder to spot. Of course, in Junior's case, he wasn't hard to spot because he's in all of two scenes before Hesh points it out in no uncertain terms. Man is driven in toto by his insecurities. And instead of immediate violent responses, this type usually attacks those around them in tiny bites that take a long time to get big enough to notice. At the same time, when I was young, he told my girl cousins I would never be a varsity athlete, and frankly, that was a tremendous blow to my self-esteem. What are you asking him for? He never even had the makings of a varsity athlete. All I know is he never had the makings of a varsity athlete. A son of a bitch! Now, while Tony may have grown up to be the arrogant, proud type like his father, at least based off what little we see of Johnny Boy, AJ doesn't appear to be an apple that fell from that tree. In fact, according to the definitions in Law 19, he seems more like an apple that fell off of Junior's tree. So clearly, Junior had an affair with Carmella and is actually AJ's father. The next category listed is Mr. Suspicion, which is described as a variant of the previous groups, but the least dangerous of the three. He sees what he wants, usually the worst in others, imagines enemies everywhere. I'm dragging a bunch of fucking ghouls around with me. Mike is their fucking ringleader. And is the easiest of the three to deceive. While most of the characters have some degree of this type in them, which is understandable considering the company they keep, probably the best example of this category is Polly Walnuts. His suspicious nature, which is amplified exponentially by his extremely superstitious nature, makes it very easy for him to believe that people have turned against him, which is something that can be used to effectively manipulate him. Now, a good argument could be made that Polly should be in the hopelessly insecure category, and he definitely has some of that in him. However, I think the ease with which he is manipulated puts him more in this one. An argument can also be made that he belongs in the next category due to his willingness to hold a grudge for a very long time. Wait to the wise. Remember Pearl Harbor. 
However, he isn't clearly cold and calculating enough to be considered a serpent with a long memory. If hurt or deceived, this type may not show it outwardly as much, rather they calculate and wait. Then, when they are in a position to turn the tables, their revenge will be marked by a cold coolness, and by far the most successful example of this group is Carmine Sr. Eight years later. I bet that guy we're talking about is fucking your wife. He can go. The guy wasn't making him money no more. And that was Carmine Lupatazzi. But probably the most entertaining example would be Livia. Now, a good case can be made that she was the insecure type, and she does have some of that in her as well. She used tiny attacks to wear down Johnny Boy to a nub and do who knows how much damage to Tony. However, it's important to note here that she was largely limited due to practicality. Being a woman, she was in no position to really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the men in her life in a conventional sense. Little attacks were really all she had. But when the opportunity presented itself to turn the tables, even on her own son, she did so with a cold cruelness. Quick side note, when evaluating these characters on some of the more specific details and examples given, I began to notice that Livia and Junior have a lot more in common than meets the eye. Now this is not something I'm going to get into in this episode because it would take us too far off topic, but let me know in the comments if you think this is something you'd like to see examined in its own episode. The last category listed is the plain, unassuming, and often unintelligent man, which of course brings to mind Bobby Bacala. According to Green, the danger with this group isn't physical violence or long-term revenge, it's the potential waste of time, energy, and resources that they represent. One potential way to identify if someone is in this group is to have a simple joke ready and gauge their response. Doctor says, you have a cataract. The Chinaman says, no, I have a rink in Continental. You don't get it? I get it. He drives a Lincoln. And if it's utterly literal, they probably are. In Bobby's case, the waste that he represents is a high-ranking position. There is nothing he does that requires him to be a top-ranking guy. Almost all of the duties we see him perform could be carried out by a soldier, and he is just taking up an important position that could be given to a better candidate. On top of that, having him in that high of a position doesn't make the Jersey mob look very good. Paul, you got the area? No, management. Tony Soprano, obviously, plus Silvio Dante, and we think Bobby Bacchieri. That Mortadelle's number three? Of course, that does beg the question of who to replace him with, which brings us right back around to the crisis of talent that has plagued Tony through the 48 Laws series, but doesn't change the fact that Bobby is an idiot in a high position. Now, while the advantages of being able to identify and therefore more effectively deal with the different types of people during your rise to power may be obvious, the often overlooked advantage comes in the maintaining of power because, as Green notes, you never know who will be powerful tomorrow. This is a dynamic we see early in the series with Junior and Jackie April Sr., as well as later on with Tony and Phil Leotardo. And the historical example given for this dynamic is Genghis Khan, which of course immediately brings to mind Irina. In the early 13th century, Muhammad the Shah of Khwarezm was the head of a powerful empire. In 1219, he received an embassy from a new tribal leader to his east that wanted to reopen the Silk Road and split the money. Muhammad thought it was arrogant for the new guy to address him as an equal, so he dismissed them. Next, a convoy of gifts was sent to Muhammad, but was stolen by one of his governors before reaching him. Assuming it was a mistake, a third convoy was sent, and this time Muhammad personally had one of the ambassadors beheaded and sent the other two back with shaved heads. The next message they received said simply, You have chosen war. And since the then-unknown new tribal leader was Genghis Khan, I'm sure you can all guess how that played out for Muhammad. In this example, Muhammad made two relevant mistakes when it comes to this episode. First, he assumed that because someone was less important that they were harmless. And second, he mistook the fact that Genghis Khan was slow to anger and assumed instead that he meant he would never act. Clearly he was wrong in both regards, as was Tony when it came to Irina. Now, Irina wasn't ruthless like Genghis Khan, she was a sweetheart and was described as such, but that didn't mean that she wasn't harmless and would never go for the jugular. Tony found this out the hard way after she called and talked to Carmela, spilling all the beans and proving that she does have a bit of that serpent in her, which is the type of person Tony consistently has the most trouble with. For someone involved in the activities that Tony is in and treats people the way he does, the serpent is especially dangerous because people like Tony need people to forget and move on. With the number of people Tony has screwed over and the number of years he has been doing it, it's impossible for him to keep track of all of them, especially going back decades. 
Well, thanks for watching this episode here on Bully Whispers. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.